and good evening ladies and gentlemen i'm pallavi and i welcome all of you to the second episode of hsi prime time i'd start by thanking dr bitner for accepting our invite and agreeing to speak in this program and dr chobi sir for graciously agreeing to host the program it's an absolute honor to have the two legends of surgery on the screen together and having the privilege of learning from them uh in this program we are going to uh, have a 30 minutes lecture by dr bitner followed by an interactive conversation between dr bitner and dr chobe before we start i'll uh, say a little bit about hernia society of india i think most of our audience is already aware for those who are not hernia society of india is the national chapter of asia pacific hernia society and we are very active academically in this academic year we have had over 20 high value virtual academic programs including a 3 day virtual live conference hsi prime time is the most recent addition to our academic programs designed by our to innovation what does it take to reach where they have reached and what are the challenges that they have faced in the process today we'll have the conversation on the extra peritoneal repair of ventral hernias they are the hot new kids on the block in the hernia surgery town and it's only fitting to be able to hear about it from a man who's seen it all and done it all you are all going to love today's session and with that i'd hand over the screen to dr s p de sarkar to introduce our legends of today's episode dr sarkar the screen is all yours thank you thanks pallavi and thanks to our honorary president dr ramesh agarwal hsi for allowing me to have this privilege to introduce dr bitner and dr pradeep chobe i start with dr bitner Reinhard Bittner, MD, FRCS, FICLS, is a recognized leader in the fields of minimum invasive surgery. He was trained in general and vascular surgery in the University Hospitals of Berlin, LCM in the upper GI tract, colorectal, and pancreatic surgery. After his university career, he served for nearly 20 years as director and professor of surgery of the Department of General and Visceral Surgery. at marian hospital stuttgart teaching hospital of the medical university of tubingen during this time under his leadership more than 60000 patients more than 16000 laparoscopic inguinal hernia repairs in tap technique 9000 laparoscopic cholecystectomies more than 1500 laparoscopic colorectal resections were operated on about 20000 by himself mainly in minimally invasive technique during the last 15 years already in early 90s he recognized the advent of minimally invasive surgery as an important step to the development of more patient friendly surgery therefore he focused more and more on these new techniques especially he concentrated on the transabdominal preperitoneal patch plasty tapp in inguinal hernia repair from the beginning all patients data were recorded and analyzed inclusive a careful done follow up interestingly tap was standardized and popularized with the result that this new technique could routinely performed by all surgeons in his hospital and by all surgeons willing to learn outside his hospital he organized countless workshops and prospective studies as well as consensus conferences published the data in leading journals and was mainly involved in the development of guidelines in hernia surgery three edited books related to hernia surgery and written by international team of experts of hernia surgery completed his work dedicated to the hernia repair not at least due to his leadership more than 60% of hernia repairs in germany are currently done in laparoscopic technique 40% of them are tap During the last year, he developed and published a new minimal invasive technique, endoscopic minimal uh, oblique less open sublay for repair of ventral and incisional hernias 
combined with the rectus diastasis. This technique allows the implantation of the large meshes 20 into 30 or 40 centimeter in the retromuscular space by a skin incision not wider than 5 centimeter and avoiding the access through the abdominal cavity. He was the founding president of German Association of Minimal Invasive Surgery and organized innumerable educational meetings and live surgery demonstration in minimally invasive surgery. Furthermore, he was founding member of the German Hernia Society and vice president of this society for 10 years. Currently, he is honorary president of the society. He has published more than 350 original papers, six randomized control studies, RCTs, two systemic reviews, five guidelines, and has given a countless number of scientific lectures, not only in Germany, but also around the world, in total 38 countries outside Germany. His impact factor reaches 480. He did live surgery in laparoscopic hernia repair, not only, no, but also in cholecystectomy and the colonic resection in about 60 institutions in more than 23 countries in Europe, America, Africa, and Asia. For eight years, he was a member of board of directors of German Society of Surgery, president of German Society of General and Visceral Surgery in 2005 and 6. He received the Doctor Honoris Causa, Dr. A.C. from University of Yangu, China, and University of Vilnius, Lithuania, one of the oldest in Europe. Moreover, he was honored with the honorary membership of the Society of Minimally Invasive Surgery, Lithuania, the Asia Pacific Hernia Society, Indian Association of Gastrointestinal Endosurgeons, and Indonesian Society of Endolaparoscopic Surgeons. He was honored with the title Fellow of Royal College of Surgery, England, FRCS, and the Fellowship of the International College of Laparoscopic Surgeons, FICLS. In 2008, he was uh, he received the Rudolf Pichi Mayer Medal, the highest award for German Society of General and Visceral Surgery. In 2010, he received the Knight Cross given by the President of Germany. Since 2015, he serves as subject editor of the Journal of Surgical Endoscopy for the section Hernia and the HPV Surgery. Since 2018, he serves as the European Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal of Abdominal Wall and Hernia Surgery. Between 2019 and 20, he worked as full professor of Sikno University in Moscow, Russia. In summary, Reinhard Wittner is a tireless worker for many years, serving the German Hernia Society as an auditor for the acknowledgement of German Hernia Center to improve outcome and the surgeons as subject editor of the prestigious journal of the surgical endoscopy to improve the science in hernia treatment. He and his wife, Uti, are living in Stuttgart, Germany, and are proud parents of the three grown children and 10 grandchildren. In his scarce free time, he likes to read, to visit museums, especially for painting, to discuss political affairs and football with his children and traveling and cooking and gardening with his wife. That's Dr. Bittner presented proudly on behalf of Hania Society of India. Now, <laughs> I, or, I know for this our gathering, we need no introduction for uh, Dr. Pradeep Chauve, who is the mentor of Hania Society of India, that's the APHS, is the Indian Association of uh, IA Gastrointestinal Endosurgeons, Professor Chow, Dr. Chove is the man, is the leader who actually inspired all of us and took the minimally invasive surgery to every corner of India. We can talk half an hour about him, but he is the teacher of teachers and he took all of us, inspired all of us to take the minimal invasive surgery to the poorest of the poor and all corners of India. I feel the two giants meet and we are the very inquisitive learners and students. Thank you, sir. I request Dr. Bittner to start his presentation. Yeah, thank you. Very, thank you very much.
first of all, uh, many, many thanks for this very kind introduction. Uh, I personally, <laughs> I'm being impressed uh, about all what you taught about me. <laughs> and, um, but um, uh, still, I remain a very simple human being. And <laughs> this is, I'm uh, especially proud, proud of. So um, it is a great honor to, to speak here about my last uh, project and with special um, uh, um, uh, happy to see my very, very old friend Pradeep Shobi here. And uh, I think it's about 20 years so we are working together uh, and uh, met uh, each other around the world. And always it was a great uh, event, a great pleasure uh, to see you in Delhi and to talk with you and to learn something about your great country. So once again, um, many, many thanks. And uh, uh, to um, uh, Dr. Agavala, uh, many thanks for this uh, invitation and also uh, for Professor Desarca uh, for the introduction. And uh, so I'm, I'm very proud of. So uh, best greetings uh, from Stuttgart. And you know, uh, we are producing Porsche and uh, Mercedes uh, cars and a lot of other things. But my topic uh, today, uh, as I told you, my last, uh, I think it will be my last project, that is uh, abdominal wall, uh, hernia with um, endoscopic knee. And um, allow to talk uh, some historical remarks. Uh, I started my education in 1970 in, in, in Berlin and look at that time uh, we had, it was a big hospital uh, taking care for more than 300,000 uh, people of Berlin. We had only 22, 30 operations because of abdominal wall hernias per year, only 22, 30. And this was the same when I accompanied uh, Professor Bega, who get the share in University Hospital of Ulm. Surgery of abdominal wall hernias at that time didn't play any significant role. And this changed dramatically when I became a chief surgeon in Stuttgart in 1990. You can see um, gradually an, an increase uh, of the, these um, uh, hernia operations, so nearly uh, 300, because of abdominal wall hernias um, we did per year at uh, that time, at my active time. So the reason uh, for this uh, dramatic increase, you see I listed uh, six reasons. It is, of course, it's modern surgery with uh, uh, less restrictions, especially to aged patients, and also the radical um, uh, operations because of peritonitis with open abdomen as, uh, and laparastoma. So uh, a lot of reasons of, uh, uh, responsible for this dramatic increase of uh, surgery of the abdominal wall. And uh, so uh, currently we have in Germany about 50,000 uh, um, uh, hernias because of primary and secondary abdominal wall hernias and in the US uh, more than 200,000 and I think in India it will be five, 600,000 operations uh, per year. So um, this, these operations are not only important for the individual patient but uh, because of this huge number and uh, you know, uh, and you you know, um, most of these patients are uh, not so aged, so they are in the middle of their their, their or at the end of their uh, work. So uh, you can imagine that this is 
also a huge economic factor for the healthcare system. And um, this situation, this dramatic increase uh, re is reflected also in the scientific uh, literature. My research for uh, the, in PubMed for the publications with the term incisional hernia after, um, before invention of the laparoscopic technique by Carl Leblanc uh, in 1993, we had um, uh, no more than 100 publications in a five year, in a five year interval. And currently, it is more than 1,500 uh, uh, publications you can find in PubMed with the term incisional hernia. So a huge, a huge impact on research. So I, I want to uh, uh, discuss uh, four points with you. First uh, question is, should we use a mesh? or is future repair uh, sufficient? Uh, then sex, second question, which is the best position of the mesh within the different um, uh, layers of the abdominal wall? Then third question, how to bring the mesh in the best position? And last question, should we use a hybrid technique, an open technique or a pure endoscopic technique. First question, mesh or no mesh? And you can see already in 2005, we published our data uh, from the early years um, of uh, uh, in, in, in Stuttgart. The early years, um, uh, we repaired abdominal wall hernias. And we could compare uh, suture uh, repair as we did in the beginning of the 90s, then we changed to mesh repair in the middle uh, and the end of the 90s. And you can see um, in this analysis, uh, when we had the mesh repair, uh, after five years, we had only 5% recurrences. Suture repair, 18% uh, recurrences. And uh, it is interesting, interesting that in a recent uh, study, um, uh, we had just the same, the same results with mesh repair uh, around 7% recurrence rate and with suture repair nearly 24% uh, recurrence rate. So the first uh, question, very clear to answer, the use of mesh reduces significantly the recurrence rate. Second question, what is the best Position and you can see we have uh, about uh, five uh, positions um, shown in, in these schematas. Uh, and um, so, what is what is the best? Should we do an inlay bridging, and should we do onlay, sublay, or should we do lap IPOM? Or as uh, Flamand already in two thousand one. Uh, propagated, should we use a preperitoneal uh, position? So, um, recent uh, literature, recent research shows that the best position, uh, like uh, Reeves propagated in 1973, and Holin um, uh, concluded that placing mesh in the supply position, as opposed to the only or underlay position, may decrease the risk of hernia recurrence and the risk of surgical site in, in infections. So, um, the, so the answer seems to be uh, quite clear. The supply or retromuscular position seems to be the best position. Now the third question, how to bring the mesh in, the, in this best position? By open technique, we have well-known disadvantages, big trauma to the abdominal wall, seroma production, infection, and pain. So now the question is, is the IPOM 
technique, the solution. But IPOM technique has also disadvantages. The risk for bowel injury, the risk for adhesions and later on ileus formations, and high costs. The special mesh, the tax are costly. And that is important regarding pain. There is no significant difference between open supply and the IPOM technique. So, um, what is the answer? We can say that up to now, there is insufficient, insufficient evidence to answer this question. However, laparoscopic approach reduces surgical site complications. That is quite clear. There is no question. But the costs are significantly higher, as I mentioned. So, is the Milos concept the solution? The Milos concept was developed by Wolfgang Reinpold. Can this concept overcome the disadvantages of these two techniques, the transabdominal route, the IPOM, or the uh, open uh, mesh uh, placement? Milos concept means many or less open supply. Small skin incision, we can implant a very large mesh, a very simple mesh, must not be covered, cheap mesh. We can bring it in the retromuscular position without entering the abdominal cavity. It needs no fixation. And in summary, it's a low cost procedure. We, uh, um, uh, Wolfgang Reinpold and our team, we could publish the results in Annals of Surgery in 2019. With the propensity score, we could compare about 600 patients with the IPOM technique or the open supplex technique with the help of the data of our hernia made registry. And the result was, with the Milos technique, we saw less complications, less recurrences, and less chronic pain. So, uh, some remarks about the Milos uh, technique. We have a small skin incision, then we uh, just in front of the hernia sac or the hernia defect, then, then uh, uh, the hernia sac is dissected and the hernia ring is exposed. The hernia ring will be elevated with the sharp clamps. And then the hernia sac will be pushed down and also the preperitoneal pet so that the posterior rectal sheet can be exposed. Then the next is the incision of the posterior rectus sheet about one to, centi uh, to two centimeter laterally of the linea alba. As you can see here, we have uh, the, the, the anterior sheet of the, uh, the anterior sheet of the uh, um, uh, rectus sheet, and here the posterior, that is the rectus muscles, the, the back wall, and then uh, if we have this uh, opening, then the posterior rectal sheet is incised bilaterally upwards in direction to the cyphoid and downwards in direction to the symphysis. And Wolfgang Reimpold used special long instruments and a special developed light source. And this is important. The linear alba has to be strictly preserved. So incision continued here, incision continued there, and the same on the other uh, uh, side. So we, uh, 
we uh, visited um, uh, Dr. Reimpold in Hamburg, and then we, uh, with my co-worker Jochen Schwarz, we tried to reproduce this technique in Rottenburg, where I was uh, busy during uh, the last uh, four years. And then um, we saw that it's very difficult uh, to, to do a very good um, um, uh, dissection the more the distance between the small skin incision and uh, the needed dissection area uh, far from this incision is the more difficult the operation. Uh, as I mentioned before, a uh, special instrument in the special light source is needed. You can uh, um, um, make the comparison. You are in uh, uh, standing just in front of a cave, on the entrance of a cave, and you should dissect very far, very far from this entrance. So you should you should do something in the uh, at the end of this. As, uh, of this cave. So we had the um, um, idea, why should we, shouldn't we do this endoscopically? So, um, and then we develop um, a step by step the emulos uh, uh, operation, the emulos operation. Emulos operation uh, means we do just in the beginning the same like the milos, but then we close the skin and continue with endoscopic um, surgery. So when we started in um, uh, 2016 uh, with this uh, technique, um, I'd say uh, variation one, that was uh, that we introduced like in, in the TEP, what I so many times uh, saw with, uh, with uh, my, my great friend uh, Pradeep Chobi, we introduced a balloon and in the beginning we used uh, the balloon, um, Pradeep uh, published, uh, I, I think about 20 years ago, uh, we used uh, a finger glove uh, balloon to, to save cost. You no, know, I worked in a small hospital and uh, not very rich, so we had to to calculate with uh, with uh, every uh, every euro. So we did Pradeep's technique with this uh, finger glove uh, um, balloon and introduced uh, this um, uh, two direction um, a super pubic area, as you can see on the on the right on the right uh, slide here. So then we dilated uh, this uh, region, and then we introduced super pubic. We introduced um, the optic uh, toka, and then uh, of course uh, um, after retraction of this uh, dilation uh, balloon, then of course we we introduced uh, first from here the optic with gas, and then we uh, introduced here super pubic the definite. Uh, optic to car for uh, further uh, operation. Then we closed the skin and continued, um, as you can see here, we closed in the position, the first optic to car, and then we, uh, we, we started the, uh, with the endoscopic operation with the help of uh, two um, working to car, five millimeter, right side, left, side that is uh, easy here the hernia defect you can see the hernia defect this is uh, this uh, toka um on inside so you can see from from outside and we had here um several um needles to mark the uh, the region we had dissected and um this dissection is uh, is uh, as you can see um is is very easy we have uh, we have the, the rectus muscle. We have the um, uh, the, the preperitoneal fat. We have uh, the rectus sheet as the, the right side, 
Rectus Masse, Rectus Sheet, Linie Alba hier, Linie Alba. And the Linie Alba must uh, be preserved. So the incision is just about one centimeter lateral to the Linie Alba. Here's the, the posterior Rectus Sheet, Linie Alba. Here's the Rectus Masse. And step by step, you can use this, uh, this um, scissor, but you can also use an electro hook. It's very nice with electro hook and linear alba and pushing down, pushing down the preperitoneal fat, not, uh, uh, not open the abdominal cavity. And step by step, you uh, will approach uh, from the umbilical uh, region, you will approach uh, the siphoid, rectus, rectus muscle. Then again, the, the, the rectus sheet, the posterior rectus sheet, the left side. And it is uh, very nicely, as I can uh, show you uh, just uh, in some seconds, you can identify the neurovascular bundles and you can preserve, of course, so no injury no danger for the neurovascular uh, um, supply of the rectus muscle and the other muscles of the abdominal uh, wall. So it's very, uh, as, as you can see, all these operations I assisted to uh, Dr. Schwartz because I, you know, in, in, in my age and so on, I wanted that the technique will be learned by a younger one and then continued. Yes, one of the, of the rectomuscular, uh, neuromuscular bundle. And you can see it's, it's wonderful. It's very easy uh, to dissect this. Very easy. And here, the siphoid. Here you can see the siphoid. So you must go uh, below the siphoid to push the mesh in uh, in the uh, within the so-called um, uh, uh, fatty triangle. Now th there was a uh, needle from outside to to show where we are working. Took her needle, rectus muscle, uh, the costal margin, siphoid. Siphoid, again lateral, siphoid, posterior rectus sheet, needle here for marking, needle, needle here. Uh, you can see then from outside the position. And then um, for dissection of the suprapubic region, we introduce an optic tocar here and then dissect needle. Then we can very clearly dissect the uh, uh, suprapubic uh, region. We can enter the space, the space of ratios here from outside the needles, marking this huge region the complete retromuscular region from CFOE to superpubic uh, region. And you can easily repair and uh, combined, um, then we push the mesh, the combined inguinal hernia, for example. And we track the mesh, it's a double roll. We introduce the mesh to this uh, super pubic optic tocar, 12 millimeter. And then we, we in the beginning, we had a lot of uh, stays sutures and uh, for better placement. Uh, for the placement of the mesh, it's very important to have the, the right side, uh, the right side. Normally, in, in length, it's about 30 centimeter, but in the width, it could be only 14 or 15 centimeter. And uh, correspondingly, it is um, difficult to, to spread uh, very plain 
this, uh, this mesh. If uh, you have a too large mesh, then it will be difficult to place it without any faults. And here, again, um, a, 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 the section, the linear alba, the costal margin, the cephoid, and uh, the, uh, um, the uh, down here, the preperitoneal fat with the peritoneal. You can enter easily, uh, you can enter the mediastinum here. So if necessary, if you have a big hernia in this region, then you can uh, place uh, very easily the, the mesh behind uh, the uh, sternum. Linear alba is preserved, that's very important. If you have a big rectus diastasis, of course, then you can suture uh, the rectus, uh, uh, the, the, linear, uh, the, the linear alba, the, the defect here, defect, the hernia defect, the working toka. And uh, when we started this technique, uh, we didn't care um, to um, suture the posterior wall. Uh, uh, of the rectus sheet, um, uh, we, 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 we left it open, uh, but some patients developed an, an bulging. Uh, they had no recurrence, but they had a bulging. So then we started after the first 25 cases to suture the posterior rectus sheet. This, of course, uh, the, um, the, that is not possible just in the region of the cephoid. Uh, and um, this is a region of the fatty triangle, and uh, anyway, it must be left uh, left open for placement of the mesh behind the cephoid. So, but then um, down here, uh, it is not so difficult uh, to uh, to suture. Uh, but but it's important um, it's important uh, to have a complete dissection of the retro muscular region. And you see here uh, the, the neurovascular uh, bundle. Uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can, you must preserve. And if you want, if you have um, tension, then you can continue with the TAR procedure. You, as you can, as I demonstrated here, you can open uh, the posterior rectal sheet and then continue to a TAR procedure. So that was our first uh, approach. It's, then we, we learned that it's not necessary to have uh, this uh, with the dilation uh, balloon and so on. We learned, I, I have uh, to, uh, to agree, with, uh, uh, with Beljansky and the ETP technique. So uh, then we, uh, we changed to variation two. That means we dissect all the, what I taught you here. But then we introduce the first optic uh, toka uh, below the, the, the cephoid. It is very easy. From this, you can go with your finger and introduce this optic toka uh, with the finger, finger guiding. So it's, it's much more uh, faster than uh, to do uh, here uh, with balloon and so on and so on. So that is our... Uh, is our um, uh, uh, currently used or recommended uh, variation of this technique. And uh, you can see that this was not, not, a, not, a, not a too small hernia. And this patient, we had this uh, mesh size 20 by 30 uh, centimeter. So best indication for this technique is a uh, combination of uh, um, uh, an epigastric or umbilical or incisional hernia, a combination with, I say, an unstable uh, abdominal wall. That means in combination uh, with a significant rectus diastasis. The reason for this, uh, uh, you can say huge dissection area, implantation of the huge mesh, despite relative small hernias, is that Köhler, published uh, that if we neglect this rectus diastasis, so in my words, unstable abdominal wall, then we will have a high recurrence rate. If we do a suture repair, even in small hernias, 
or implant only a small mesh, not recognizing the unstable abdominal wall. So um, we could publish in 2017, and I, I, I think we were the first to, um, uh, to publish a reliable, a standardizable endoscopic uh, technique for uh, repair of these, uh, these hernias. So uh, the advantages compared to the minus is uh, we, need, we do not need special instruments. And that, that I must emphasize that this endoscopic dissection, I, I think all of you made this uh, experience, the endoscopic dissection is essentially easier than the open dissection because we have the help of the gas pressure. And we can do it with the very fine instruments, endoscopic instruments. So in summary, this technique is much more easier than to perform than an open dissection or the myelos mm -hmm. section. And you can see this is the patients, day one, day three. They have, they have uh, uh, astonishing less pain. After one year, nearly no scar. Uh, is is to see. So in in total, we uh, up to now uh, we over we uh, overlook uh, 173 patients, and uh, as expected, um, most 120 were umbilical epigastric hernias and rectus diastasis, but also 53 with an incisional hernia. BMI. You know, 30 is, uh, uh, you know, in uh, I think uh, everywhere these, these patients are overweight. And you can see here, that is a patient, um, he had twice an IPOM. Nevertheless, he became a recurrence because of this unstable um, abdominal wall. And this patient, it was in front of the IPOM mesh, was quite easy. This is a, a point we can discuss. 160 minutes, the, the uh, mean uh, operative time in these uh, patients, 160 mean. But we analyzed the uh, individual um, uh, times and saw that after 20 to 25 operations, this time could be uh, decreased to about 120 only. The fact size, as I mentioned, not, not, um, not very impressive, 19 uh, square centimeter. But on average, all these patients had a rectus diastasis size width 5 centimeter, 5 centimeter, and huge mesh. So standard mesh, more in uh, just 145, uh, 40, uh, 44, 30 centimeter in length, 30 centimeter in length, width between 15 and 24 centimeter. And you can see, this is really measured the um, in length of the incision, 4.6 centimeter. Hospital stay, um, uh, 4.8 days. Complications, very, very low. Only we had two revisions, so 1.4% uh, revision, about 1.4, and one up to now, only one recurrence. Um, so we planned a systematic uh, 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 follow-up uh, for the last year, but due to the pandemic, uh, we, we had... Uh, we couldn't do this, but uh, we will, uh, at least we will do, uh, we'll start with uh, with telephone call and uh, with, uh, uh, after this uh, uh, pandemic, we will do clinical uh, follow-up of these patients. But um, it's, I think, uh, impressive research. And uh, um, I want to emphasize 
really very less pain. So coming to uh, the conclusion for this, uh, for this part, best indication, as I mentioned, small, middle-sized primary, secondary ventral hernias with a concomitant rectus pierce space. Complete standardizable, complication rate low, um, uh, um, despite this uh, routinely large uh, mesh implantation, learning curve about 20 to 30 uh, cases, and cost effective because we have no um, special mesh, no fixation. Um, last, no, my last uh, question. Um, Hybrid, uh, so um, the Emilos is a hybrid technique. Or should we do uh, a pure endoscopically technique like uh, the ETP? ETP uh, technique was um, invented by Jorge Das for the inguinal hernia primary, and then from Brilliansky uh, uh, applied to uh, the ventral hernias, but they published um, their data uh, one year after after our publication. So hybrid, you you see um, what what is what is better, the pure, the pure, the original, um, or the, this hybrid. Uh, the new uh, pure endoscopic I mentioned just I mentioned by Jansky in two thousand eighteen. The enhanced view, totally extraperitoneal patch technique. Then, uh, from my Chinese uh, friends, Li, Li Bigin, we had uh, uh, last year published the, the totally endoscopic sublet technique and the total, um, totally uh, extraperitoneal approach for uh, repair of ventral hernias. Very short, this is a publication and some. Uh, some pictures um, published by uh, Bryansky. Disadvantage of this uh, uh, technique, um, the section of large hernia um, uh, sacs may be more difficult um, than in, in open. Then uh, the entering of the contralateral site may be difficult, especially in incisional hernias. And so, uh, if we have uh, a lot of scar tissue, then uh, it may also be uh, difficult and time consuming. So, the, the time, uh, the operation time published by Bediansky is much more uh, uh, longer than we had, but on the other hand, they had all also more difficult cases. So, advantage no large skin incision and no opening of the abdominal cavity. This is a, a total uh, endoscopic uh, supply technique, uh, which we published uh, last year, talk up uh, position that is very similar uh, to the endoscopic uh, part of the immunos uh, technique. And uh, uh, then uh, also a picture of the, the section of the hernia sac. And, um, uh, also, the same, you can see here, the suture of the posterior uh, rectus uh, sheet, so very similar. All the, the endoscopic um, uh, part of all these technique is, uh, techniques is uh, just the same. The same uh, disadvantages like uh, in the ETP uh, uh, technique, advantage the same. Uh, then that is a very interesting approach, but uh, not um, applicable uh, for uh, for a uh, lot of patients. That is the the um, super pubic down uh, top uh, uh, dissection um, with placement of the mesh um, uh, preperitoneal. So um, the, uh, no incision. Um, uh, of the um, posterior rectus sheet, but the dissection uh, area is between rectus sheet and the peritoneum, respectively the periperitoneum fact. Uh, so beginning is uh, is uh, uh, like uh, in the in in the um, 
endoscopic uh, supply uh, ap approach, but uh, then uh, it's the uh, exposition of the arcuate line, but not incision of the arcuate line, but going um, down uh, uh, inferior to the arcuate line and the section of the preperitoneal region. Um, uh, that is because of um, uh, the, the uh, peritoneum in many patients is very, very slim. It's very, um, uh, uh, so um, we have to be uh, very, very careful not to make holes in uh, an opening of the um, abdominal cavity. So uh, especially in incision hernia, this technique is uh, not applicable. It's only in primary hernias. So the, the advantages is, is uh, quite clear. Um, no large skin incision, no opening of the abdominal cavity, and no cutting of any structures of the abdominal wall. So in summary, um, the hybrid technique in my opinion, advantage, rapid dissection of the hernia sub. Then we can, after we position the mesh and we reopen, then the, um, uh, the, the uh, provisionally uh, skin uh, closure, we reopening for defect closure. And then we can control, we can do a, a lavage of the retromuscular region, and we can control the position uh, of the mesh uh, with a with a with a finger. Then that is uh, quite clear, easy, and safe effect closure. Disadvantage: we have a skin incision. So the totally endoscopic, no skin incision, but difficult approach to the retromuscular plane of the contralateral side more difficult reduction of the hernia sac and maybe difficult effect closure. But anyway, we need, we need, there's an urgent need for randomized controlled studies. Uh, some kind of therapeutic algorithm I could recommend, Milos, open in small, middle-sized primary and secondary hernia in the midline of a stepwise abdominal wall. So not needing implantation of a huge mesh. The hybrid, small, middle-sized primary and secondary hernias in the midline of an unstable abdominal wall. So in combination with his rectus, yes, cases, so we should implant a very large mesh. Totally endoscopic, we can uh, repair small, middle-sized, also in, if you have some uh, very good skills, also large primary and secondary hernias in the midline of the abdominal wall. So, um, uh, to learn more, read the guidelines, part B. Um, the new techniques are, uh, are discussed, published in 2019. So, um, Dear friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I thank you very much for your attention. And I hope um, uh, not to be uh, too long with my lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bittner. Uh, I think I speak for everyone when I say that the talk was not too long. It was actually so engaging that we lost track of all time. Uh, it was especially useful to know all the variations of my loss technique, especially for those of us who are just starting to venture into extra, totally extra bed on your space and uh, my loss technique. Uh, so uh, I, I wouldn't take a lot of your time. I, I think I would hand over the stage to Dr. Chaubiso and Dr. Bittner for a candid talk. And uh, there are a few questions, but I think Dr. Bittner has already addressed them in his talk. We'd go ahead with the conversation as we earlier planned. And as and when a question comes, I'd forward those 
asked uh, in the chat box here and on the personal whatsapp of dr chopper sir uh, sir yeah uh, thank you priya for conducting uh, this uh, so effectively and rainhart i think uh, for all these two decades i think i have listened to you so many times but every time there is something new uh, you have got some good ideas innovative ideas and uh, uh, i will also say that uh, i have been following at the very beginning of uh, 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 e my laws and uh, technique and we have discussed it on numerous occasion i very strongly advocate and uh, full heartedly agree with uh, ryan hart the way forward for abdominal wall hernia i have always maintained i'm sure our our colleagues know my approach that we have to understand that hernia is a benign condition and the surgery cannot be too extensive or too destructive but it has to be the balance and uh, for most of the hernias in groin etc we know that laparoscopy is the final answer but in the situations which have just been elaborated and mentioned by uh, rainard that is the way the modification should go and i feel that uh, this is the way forward and congratulations rainard uh, for uh, promoting it so well and also demonstrating the technique what i would for others this thing what i would like uh, to emphasize that uh, the way uh, rainard had described that the midline linea alba is sacrosanct and that is what i would you know you know you cannot just cut the linea alba and you know suture the linea alba again i think rainard Uh, I, i would like to take one big message and i would like to let everybody know that midline and linea alba is sacrosanct and we should make keep the integrity of linea alba by dividing it and resuturing it doesn't make any sense to me at least with a limited uh, understanding of the abdominal wall right now what i feel is that you know Uh, what do you think is the numbers which you have shown that in 70s the number of hernia surgeries were very less and over a period of time what do you think is your interpretation about that why why do you think that at that time the surgeries do you think the abdominal wall surgeries in totality were less and hence the hernia were less yeah uh, uh, that is a very good question i i i thought um uh, of uh, very time very often but um um the last point i listed was expectations of the patients uh at that time um if the patient um had a bulge uh in the midline um he didn't care a lot a lot of he didn't care of um or he was operated um, let's say stomach or colon and developed uh, also a bulge so okay he said or oh, had pain okay i i i was operated so that's quite normal i have uh, i have a bulge um and oh, they came uh, not before some um uh, incarceration or so uh, happened so now the expectations of the patients at least uh, in uh, in uh, in in our country and uh, i think also around the world is uh, you want to have a perfect body no no scar no pain no bite and uh, so the patients go earlier um, to uh, to the doctor not not when it is in uh, sometimes it was too too late with a huge uh, huge bite so i think this is one point and the other is of course modern surgery uh, vascular surgery especially uh, with this uh, aneurysm uh, surgery with uh, in uh, we know these patients have a very weak 
weak um, uh, tissue, connective. And, yeah, co connective tissue, and develop much more um, uh, hernias. At that time, uh, we had, for example, for total gastrectomy, we had 50 years that was age limit. So today we have all age groups. So that's another, I think, with uh, with in, 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 in increasingly weak connective tissue. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think you will contribute uh, the more liberal, more frequent uh, cesarean sections also uh, for responsible for these hernias, abdominal wall hernias? Very rare in Germany. Very, very rare. Yeah. Uh, Supra pubic hernias are very, very rare uh, um, following uh, cesarean uh, sections. Very, very, very rare in, in, in Germany. Yeah, but then you're talking of the transverse incisions, but you know, sometimes, yeah. you know, the less experienced gynecologist in a smaller places might like to give, at that time, I'm not talking now, but I think they might have been giving more vertical paramedial or uh, incisions. Second point, you know, I would have expected it more because at that time, I think all of us, we were using chromic cat gut and plain cat gut, and that was the only thing available to us for closing the abdomen. So one would expect more uh, chances uh, of uh, herniation. So that is one point. Another point which uh, I feel now, uh, which you may find it a little funny also, but do you think now the abdominal wall, the period of abdominal wall hernia is over? Because for the last 30 years, we are doing all laparoscopic uh, surgery. So most of the abdominal interventions are laparoscopic. And thanks to persistent uh, uh, push from person like you, who uh, will literally get agitated if somebody talks about the conventional, say, of hernia surgery, at least for groin, I've seen you. You really are very passionate about uh, endoscopic. And if I'm not exaggerating, I think, Reinhard, you are one person. You fought the battle uh, with the great warriors uh, uh, just to promote and to emphasize that laparoscopic surgery and endoscopic surgery is the future of uh, at least hernia surgery. I know that you have got a lot of interest in colon, uh, but you are known more for hernia than we are talking about it. So uh, this is what I feel that uh, in, in future, do you think the, there will be less abdominal wall hernia because yeah. of this laparoscopic revolution? Yeah, that is um, a very, very good uh, prognosis. Yeah, I, 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 I think I can agree. Um, I can agree. We, we will see. We will see. Mm -hmm. um, we have the problem with toca hernias. So some points are uh, to to respect also in, in endoscopic surgery. Um, uh, we can discuss, especially um, uh, to minimize the in instruments and uh, uh, also uh, look that the uh, position of the two cars yeah. is not too lateral, not in the big parts of the abdominal wall. It's, uh, I think these points are... Um, Especially in in uh, you do a lot of obesity surgery, especially in these in these patients. We have uh, we have a uh, lot of cases with uh, toca hernias. So that is a point we have to work on um, to improve the instruments and also to define um, the positions uh, where uh, best position not to develop. Um, Toka hernias later on. But, uh, okay, this is some melody of future. Um, for this time, I think um, we should take more care to close the abdominal wall in the best way. Um, in former times, it was um, the big surgeon uh, did the intra-abdominal operation and then he left and the use uh, could close. <laughs> in my my opinion, um, as you take the, as you build your bed, then you will rest. So if you 
open uh, the, the opening uh, uh, is very important. You mentioned the linear alba. I, uh, I appreciate it. very, very much. I appreciate it. So you have to be very careful to open in the middle of the linear alba and then do small bite technique with uh, with uh, long uh, absorbable or uh, not absorbable, better uh, not absorbable suture and very careful uh, suture the fascia, not the muscle uh, with big bites. And that is the point uh, I can, for my personal you, you have uh, the data where in my introduction, we, I did so many abdominal wall uh, surgery, uh, but uh, I can confess um, the rate uh, of uh, incisional hernias were, not, were not, so, not so high because it was my always precise opening in the midline and then very careful suture the fascia not taking big bites with the muscle because then you will have necrosis and um, uh, that the suture will not uh, not hold uh, any longer and so on and so on. So this is also a very, very important point. And also I would like to add that all I think all the ports which are more, more than five millimeter, I think they should be closed uh, 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 methodically and systematically without any doubt and again for the our youngsters i would say that please try to make bigger ports above the umbilicus level of umbilicus i would say above the level of umbilicus and and medial to the mid clavicular line because these are the strong areas where port herniation is not uh, or maybe less chances of uh, herniation so yeah. that is uh, one another point uh, I will appreciate uh, my other senior colleagues. If uh, they have any questions, please go ahead. Hmm. Ramesh? Yes. So I don't think we could have asked for something more. Two stalwarts of hernia surgery in the world scene together sharing this time. And I can speak on behalf of all the Indian audience that Professor Bittner, we are really privileged and proud, and Professor Chobe, to both uh, to have both of you all together on this Saturday evening. And uh, we have all learned so much from your knowledge and experience. And this is, it will make a lot of us better surgeons, better hernia surgeons. And thank you very much, Professor Bittner, for accepting our invitation in one mail. I know you are a very busy surgeon. Now you have difficult times also. You have the second lockdown. But in spite of everything, you agreed to come overboard and deliver this talk. And this talk was very, very enlightening because we have been talking about the retrorectus repair and you have given this hybrid approach, which was very, very innovative and very, very useful. And I think many of us in India are going to follow what you've shown today and help our patients recover better. Professor Chaube, sir, thank you very much. You are, as I always say, you're always a phone call away and there is never a no from you. You're always there for teaching and training and leadership. And all of us look up to you throughout India and throughout the world for your leadership. And uh, you always, you know, in spite of your such a busy schedule, you, you give the impression that you're always available. And we are very, very grateful and privileged to have you with us. And Dr. S.P. Dev Sarkar, who is from Calcutta. He is now the treasurer of Indian Association of Gastrointestinal Endosurgeons, and he has held many positions in the uh, Indian Association of Gastrointestinal Surgery. He's a prolific surgeon, very good teacher, does a lot of endoscopic surgeries. And in the eastern part of India, he's supposed to be an endoscopic wizard. And he started training programs in medical colleges, and I don't know where uh, Satya Priyo gets all his energy. And he still has a smile on his face after the end of the hard day. And Pallavi, thank you very much for organizing and always being there. I keep on bothering her with small details, but she always has this beautiful smile on her face and mm -hmm. always willing. And the way she organizes, I'm very, very impressed, Pallavi. The way you speak, the way you organize. And the way you look at small details, that is very, very 
impressive. So thank you very much, Pallavi. And thank you very much, Docs Blessers, for being a part of Hone Society throughout this pandemic. And as Pallavi said, we've had a lot of programs which were very well attended. And I'm grateful to all of you all for this excellent meeting. Thank you very much, Professor Bittner, Sir, Pradeep Chabir, Satyapriya, Pallavi, and Doc Spexis. Good evening and good night. Good night. Good Thank night. you very much. Thank you Thank very much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Privilege. Thank you. Thank you.